Thanks for joining us. I'm Douglas Benyon, Chair of the Technical Committee for the Insulating Concrete Forms Manufacturers Association, or ICFMA. In recent years, it's been my distinct pleasure to be part of two teams of experts that have created some very unique, some very comprehensive, and very detailed resources on how to build insulated concrete buildings under Part 9 here in Canada. So with that, I'd like to suggest on behalf of the six-member ICFMA that there has never been a better time to adopt ICF technology. Emerging building codes are driving higher and higher requirements for both thermal performance and resilience in our structures, both of which are right in the wheelhouse of insulated concrete technology. You know, technology doesn't drive change. It is our response to the options and opportunities that the technology provides that drives change. So with that, I would like to share with you some opportunities that will help to grow your business. Rather than just formwork, I like to call an ICF a highly engineered insulation system because there's an awful lot more going on than just concrete forming. Do ICFs form your concrete? Of course they do, and they do it very well. Any wall height you like, any concrete core size you like, they do it quickly, they do it efficiently, and guess what? At the end of the day, you don't have to strip them. What could be better? Well, let me show you what could be better. There are three elements that are required by the building code in the exterior width of your building, and that is a thermal enclosure, an air control layer, and a moisture control layer. All three of these are present in the ICF assembly. The thermal enclosure provided by the ICF itself, the air control layer and the moisture control layer by the concrete core. All required by the building code, all present in the ICF assembly. Did we mention that concrete doesn't burn very well? The typical six inch ICF core is a rated three hour fire barrier. The typical eight inch ICF wall is a rated four hour fire barrier. The ICF itself can be used as a substrate for finishes, both exterior and interior, directly applied to the ICF, and the ICF can serve as a substrate for utilities by cutting chases back into the foam, back to concrete, inserting plumbing and wiring runs, applying drywall to the outside, and away you go. The ICF assembly is also an excellent sound attenuation barrier with a typical SDC rating of about 50 or higher. This is usually the minimum benchmark for separation between units in multifamily buildings and it's all supplied by the ICF wall. So what you end up with is an extremely resilient structure. The most resilient structure that your money can buy, a reinforced concrete structure. All of this contained within a very small cross-section of the exterior of your building. So let's take a look at the insulating power of our ICF wall via the results of some independent testing that was commissioned by the ICFMA, wherein we tested a range of framed walls that are in common use today versus our off-the-shelf ICF. And here are the results. We tested five competing walls, both 4 inch and 6 inch, both wood frame and steel frame in different insulation configurations. And you notice a couple of things. Number one is that the ICF wall here on the end in green performed much better than any of the other walls. That's for starters. Number two is that the claimed R value or the, the nominal R value that appears on the outside of the package of the insulation does not measure up to the actual tested value of the wall. An R20 2x6 framed wall tests out at R14.8. An R24 high density bad insulation wall tests out at 18.7. Why is that? Well, again, two reasons. Number one is the air infiltration allowed by the wood walls that the uh, and wood and steel framed walls that the ICF doesn't have. And number two is the thermal transmission through the studs or thermal bridging through the studs that the framed walls have that again, the ICF wall does not have. So much better thermal performance by the ICF wall. Now, just about everybody has seen ICFs used in the construction of foundations and basements. And the builders are far enough down the pike to where they're getting quite proficient with this technology. So they tell us that their costs 
are at or below the cost of the conventional formwork that they used to use. And in addition to that, they are experiencing faster build times, usually a day or two on any project, which can be spent in other parts of the construction, and it's a big advantage to the builder. Uh, these are examples of above grade construction, which is the focus of the design guide that I talked about earlier and we'll talk about quite a lot more. Um, becoming the product of choice for many people across Canada, not only for the thermal efficiency benefits and the long-term cost benefits of the operation of the building, but because of a more competitive upfront building cost. Now for just a couple of moments, I'd like to introduce another great how-to resource for ICF technology, and that is the Building Envelope Guide for Houses under Part 9 Residential Construction as offered by the BC Housing Research Centre. Now, I had the pleasure of advising on this committee for the revision for a couple of years, and my job was to make sure that ICFs got looked at completely and accurately for the benefit of those wishing to pick up this technology. Now, the result has been a very comprehensive guide from footings to trusses that shows the construction of ICF buildings. No detail left out wall-to-ceiling transitions, exterior doors and windows, foundation walls, ledger connections, penetrations through the wall, all covered in the guide. Here's an example of a window installation, one of four methods that we found very, very successful in testing that was sponsored by BC Housing that will give you down to the finest detail on how to install windows in an ICF building. Now this guide is endorsed by the Building Officials Association of BC as well as the Provincial Building Safety Standards Branch. So I would really recommend that you go to the BC Housing website, download this guide, and it will give you some of the most up-to-date and current information on installation of ICFs. Now, as I said, today's focus is going to be on ICF wall design, as outlined in the new ICF engineering guide from ICFMA. Again, dealing with houses and small buildings constructed with ICFs, typically residential and some commercial uses, the guide is compliant to the 2015 National Building Code of Canada, and there is a planned update for the 2020 National Building Code as soon as it is released. This guide is the property of the six member companies of the ICFMA, and at this point is not extent upon any other ICF design besides these six companies. However, it is our intention to offer this material in total to the 2025 version of the building code and hopefully it will be adopted and therefore usable by any ICF as long as it's a flat wall concrete design. Our consulting engineer was Tacoma Engineers out of Ontario, one of the most experienced structural engineers in the business, particularly with ICF. They've, they've worked with most of the ICF major producers at some point, and we have gone in as a group and asked them to make a design guide for the association. A lot of experience and knowledge concentrated in this one firm, particularly with regard to ICFs. Why even bother with a prescriptive ICF design guide? Well, I think there are several reasons. Number one, it preserves the ability for the small and medium-sized contractor to build ICF concrete buildings prescriptively out of Part 9 without the benefit of site-specific engineering, the benefit or the cost of site-specific engineering. It also places ICF concrete building designs well within the scope of drafters, home designers and building technologists, as well as the mainline architects with the big firms. So that ability gets expanded out over a much wider scope of design professionals. It lowers the cost of adopting ICF technology because the engineering is taken out of the loop. If you are building within the limits of the ICFMA guide, then you may rely upon the engineering stamp that is included with the guide. Next, stamped engineering data from the guide assures the building official that proper engineering has been applied to small concrete buildings being built in their jurisdiction, thereby complying with the code. And in the big picture, 
highly resilient and highly energy efficient concrete structures are helping provinces to achieve higher energy and resilience targets for their housing stock. I have a colleague that calls this guide the Swiss Army Knife of ICF design because of the incredible range of topics that are addressed and the problems that are solved within the guide. So where does the guide apply? Well, the answer is all 10 Canadian provinces, and here are the stamps for the provinces. Uh, we are working on getting the territories covered as well, but at this point, it's all 10 Canadian provinces. And on this page, you will find a stamp for your province. And this ensures compliance during plan review. So who needs this information? Well, for starters, the designer needs the structural information to make sure that the client's objectives can be achieved without going crazy on costs and to ensure that the building is constructible, ensure that it's even buildable at all. The next person that needs the structural information is the general contractor. Because they have to go in for permitting, they have to do scheduling, acquire materials, they have to do costing and quantity surveys, and make sure that everything comes together. And that requires knowing which materials are going to be needed and when. The next person that's going to need the information out of our guide is the building official to make sure that the building is in compliance with the code at a very basic level. And the last person, of course, is the person charged with installing the ICFs because they need to know what the construction details look like and give an accurate picture of what the labor costs are going to be to install it. So that is the critical path that the information out of our guide should and could follow. So what can I actually build using this guide? Well, the answer is you can build exterior or interior walls one story below grade and two stories above grade, all with ICF, either in a bearing or non-bearing function. Below grade walls can be built to a maximum of 12 feet in height with nearly full backfill. Above The first story of above grade walls can be as high as 16 feet. That's not to say that you're going to build 16 feet high all around your first story, but an entryway with a grand stairwell and an entrance might need walls that are higher than normal. And of course, your upper story would be available to ICF height of 10 feet. Now, these are wall heights that can pretty well service a very, very broad range of building designs. One interesting thing is that the floor height, the thickness of the floor, is not included in that wall height limitation. So, Yes, you need to pay attention to the overall building height, but no, the floor height is not part, is not counted as part of the wall height in the design. Now, do all levels of the building have to be ICF? No, they don't. You can build one story of ICF with framed wall above. You can build below grade with framed walls above, where we have one story of ICF below and up to two stories of framed walls above. Lastly, we can do a sort of a hybrid where we have two stories of ICF, one below grade, one above grade, and a third story of framed construction. So very, very flexible and mix and match construction methods uh, as the design requires. What else can I build? The maximum building footprint out of the guide is 3,200 square feet. Now, does that mean that you can only build a 3,200 square foot house? No, it doesn't. It means that the bottom story, the one touching the earth, must be limited to 3,200 square feet or 297 meters in size. A friend of mine came to me and said, hey, can I build my house out of this guide? I looked at it and I calculated the ground floor to be 1,996 square feet. So no problem, he is able to build this building out of ICF and using our guide. It conforms to the prescriptive ICF guide limitation of 3,200 square feet and it conforms to the overall part nine limitation of 6,458 square feet. What's my maximum snow load? I mean, we get a lot of snow here in Canada, don't we? The guide has a limitation of 84 pounds per square foot or four kilopascals in snow load. Now that covers an awful lot of Canada. There is no place in Ontario that has a snow load higher than 84 pounds per square foot. There are very few places in BC that have a snow load higher than 84 pounds per square foot. You'll have to get a site-specific engineering process done, but just about every place in BC 
and elsewhere in Canada is less than 84 pounds per square foot. Seismic category, the maximum seismic value under the category of S sub A 0.2, which is the main one that the building code is concerned with, is 1.75. The worst case in Ontario is 0.474. So there is no place in Ontario that is too seismically challenged to preclude a design out of our ICF guide. Even in British Columbia, the maximum 1.75 value in the S sub A 0.2 category covers almost everything in BC except for a very few locations, perhaps out near Tofino, perhaps up in the Queen Charlottes, but very few places in BC have seismic categories exceeding that. So almost every place in BC is covered by our design guide. Other limitations include no building dimensions bigger than 80 feet. The aspect ratio must be 2 to 1 or 2.5 to 1, depending on the seismic category. Roof clear span, maximum 40 feet. Floor clear span, maximum 24 feet. Now, a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, can we build this house using the ICF guide? And I looked at it, and there were no walls, no building dimensions that were over 80 feet. The maximum aspect ratio was, was within 2.5 to 1. There were no roof clear spans longer than 40 feet and no floor clear spans longer than 24 feet. So this building was okay for prescriptive ICF design. So what are the tables in the guide? Tell me. There are seven key ICF design components that are discussed in the guide. The first is footing size and reinforcement. That's the first question people ask me is, how big does my footing have to be? Well, guess what? It's in the guide. Depending on how many levels of concrete and how many levels of framing you're gonna do, the footing size and reinforcement is specified. Your below grade or your basement or foundation wall reinforcement is specified. Your above grade reinforcing is specified. Where we categorize it as distributed or carrying a an even load, let's say. If there are concentrated loads, we also have above grade concentrated shear wall reinforcement tables for areas that are going to be experiencing much higher stress in shear. Windows and doors, the spans of your lintels over the width and depth and the reinforcement of them is specified. Whether it's a, an evenly distributed load across the opening or if there's a concentrated load that perhaps comes down from a uh, roof element or something that puts a concentrated load. Uh, all of that is covered in the guide. We have sort of an obscure thing where reinforcing for what we call unsupported walls at stair openings is covered. Now, it means that if you have a basement suite that requires an outside entrance, you may have a stairwell that's lined up with that wall. And that creates an unsupported condition that needs additional reinforcing. In today's market, basement rental suites, they're the rule, not the exception. And we have to cover that. We have to make sure that those walls are properly reinforced. Floors. We have specifications for attachment, bolt size, bolt spacing for wood floors that are attached to the ICF walls. So all of that is contained in the guide, uh, the seven key ICF design components. So where do you start? Where I would suggest you start it with the site address because that will lead us to the tables that give us the climate and seismic data for the, from the building code. It tells us what the snow load is going to be. It tells us what the w maximum wind load is going to be. It tells us what the earthquake threat is in that particular area, all out of tables B and C taken right from the, the building code. So when we discover the wind pressure and snow load and confirm that our design falls within those limitations in, in our guide, we're off to the next stage. Now we look at the seismic classification, the S sub A 0.2 classification, which guides us to the below grade tables that tell us how much rebar to use in our basement. Then we go to a sort of a hybrid classification. We call it S sub A ICF. It's a blend that's required under section four of the building code where we have to calculate using not only seismic category SA 0.2, but additionally SA 0.5 and combine those values. Now, we have already done that calculation 
and included it as Appendix A so you don't have to have somebody go and make that calculation for you. The building plans, we need to check to see if the number of stories is within the limitations, basement and two stories above grade, overall building dimensions and spans are, are correct, aspect ratio is correct, lintel widths don't exceed the allowable widths, and check for any unsupported basement walls. These are the things that we need at the front end of the design. How much rebar would we use? Well, it depends on the seismic threat in the area. I've taken an example from Vancouver, Surrey, and Abbotsford here where I live, and this is one of the tables out of the guide. It is a table that encompasses the values in Vancouver, Surrey, and Abbotsford because it is good for seismic 0.70 up to 1.2 classification. All of these values, Vancouver, Surrey, and Abbotsford, fall within that range. So what that tells me is that this is the correct table to look for those specifications. Now I'm making an arbitrary assumption that our soil pressure is 30 pounds per cubic foot. I could have chosen from three other tables, 45, 60, and 75 pounds per cubic foot that we have also included in the guide. In this case, I want to build a nine foot high basement. I want to put six feet of backfill against it. And it tells me that I need 15 M bar uh, vertically at 300 millimeters or 12 inches on center. Okay, that at least got me to a point where I can estimate my basement material needs. But let's go a little deeper. I call this the $20,000 engineering table. It's the same table. Um, but notice that I have a choice of building an 8-inch concrete wall, placing vertical bars at 450 or 18-inch spacing, 15M bars at 18, or I can build a 6-inch concrete wall using 15M bars at 12-inch spacing. Same 9-foot wall, same backfill. Well, why don't I just go with the 8-inch wall because it's less rebar? A couple of reasons. Number one, the cost of the rebar may be small enough to where this extra 2 inches that you gain in going from an 8-inch to a 6-inch wall might make a difference. Where I live, it will make a heck of a difference because our property values are such that houses are selling upwards of $500 a square foot. In Vancouver, upwards of $1,000 per square foot. So in, say, Burnaby, $600 a square foot, this drop from 8-inch wall to 6-inch wall on a 200-foot long typical basement wall will garner about 33 additional square feet in the building. If you multiply 33 square feet in the building times $600 a square foot, you get, yay, $20,000. That's why I call this the $20,000 engineering table. This is value added for your customer that they're not going to get unless they pay somebody big bucks to do it. Okay, what about the horizontal reinforcement? Each of these tables comes with a little section at the bottom for horizontal reinforcement, and it's all depending on whether your ICF is 12 inches, 16 inches, or 18 inches high. Because of our six members, we have all three. Um, but choose the right height for the system that you're using, and it will give you the horizontal spacing. Okay, in this case, both six inch and eight inch wall are the same, um, but it could, it could vary. What we've achieved here is a much wider scope of design capacity. We've now taken concrete building designs into the part nine prescriptive realm. Now a builder can choose to build or respond to the wishes of a client to build a concrete home right out of a book without having to hire an engineer to design the building. This is true for single family homes, multifamily structures, and some small commercial buildings under the limitations of part nine. We are now bringing a value added service to the customer. You remember that $20,000 engineering table? Well, we were able to drop from an eight inch to a six inch wall and pick up significant value in that building just by using a smart design. And we are placing extremely high performance and very resilient designs within easy reach of both builders and design professionals. A 
much wider scope of design capacity. So download a copy of both of these guides today. Go to icf-ma.org for the ICFMA website. Go to the bchousing.org research center library and download the building envelope guide for houses. Extremely low cost for all of this information for guaranteed compliance to part nine with concrete construction. If you have questions, contact me at douglas at airfoam.com. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you soon, I hope.